and then I'm going to say good evening again. Welcome. Um, I'm Alison from Stop Science World C. We're co-hosting this event with Together Against Science World C. And I'm going to pass now to their chair, Pete Wilkinson. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, huge thanks to Roy for making this possible and for giving us the benefit of his experience one that we hope none of, no others have to share. But nonetheless, thank you very much indeed for being here. Um, what I've done is uh, there are 25 or 26 questions. I can't remember how many exactly. What I've done, well, what, what actually what Alison has done is uh, sort of consolidated them into, into sections, into categories. And what I intend to do is to ask Roy a category of questions, maybe one, maybe up to four or five at once, wait till he answers and then move on to the next category. Um, we're strictly time limited, so as soon as we've got through all the categories, we'll stop there. If there is time for supplementaries or other questions that people have got to burning in their heads, we'll have a look at it then. But at the moment, we're going to buzz through these categories and listen to Roy's answers and see if we've got time left at the end for any further ones. So without further ado, if you're ready, Roy, this is a question on hindsight from Stop Size Rule C. Looking back on the period before construction started, what would you do differently? Well, thank you very much, Pete, and thank you for inviting me along to uh, Zoom you. Um, some of my colleagues, as you may know, came to Suffolk a while back. Uh, th this is not as good as a personal contact, but it is a good way of uh, getting a few points across and, and answering questions from 100 people or so. Um, let me just start by saying there's some questions that I think you ought to be asking locally. Uh, firstly, how much of our critical infrastructure uh, does the government want China to have a, a large state, a substantial stake in, size well C being one of those things? Why is PINs pressing on during the lockdown with um, hearing EDF's application for development consent order when it would make a lot more sense to wait until lockdown was over and you could have physical meetings on that? Why is EDF pushing PINs to do that when the financing for Size World C is still an unknown and uh, that's critical to it actually going ahead? Um, why, if, um, oh, I know. Why, if the government chooses the regulated asset, but the regulated asset base as its funding mechanism, should um, we consumers cover the risk that is entailed in building a nuclear power station that may never be completed and may never generate? And lastly, why is there no UK finance, either in Hinkley C, which we know for a fact, or likely to be the case for Sizewell C? These are all questions which you could ask anyone in up the chain, if you like, uh, bigger things. Uh, the second thing to say is a lot of the concerns expressed here are, seem to me to be on the assumption that size will C will go ahead. This is not a given, and from where I sit, with the amount of um, faces with some media presence, yourselves, and the amount of people who submitted the questions and shown an interest in you know, various things about it, that there's every reason to believe that uh, it isn't that likely to proceed, certainly not anytime soon in terms of getting started. I mean, even with Hinkley C, when Theresa May became Prime Minister, uh, virtually within days, uh, EDF tried to jump her into giving the go-ahead to Hinkley C, and she said no, and uh, th there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. So we, get, we got I think that close to Hinkley C, despite having development consent, not actually going ahead. Um, right, let's, let's look at the, the questions. What would we have done differently? Uh, for one thing, I think having some people who are really media savvy and up with social media and really on board to keep that stream going forward and also engage with the schools which we haven't been able to do but which EDF um, make a habit of doing uh, we've never been able to do that and I think if, if starting again I think we should have paid some money to get, get some young people on board um, local, able to go places, engage with the uh, children in the schools and get them to think about renewables as an alternative to nuclear power right before anything got started here. Thanks, Ryan. Understood. And that's very sage advice. 
Can I move on to planning, please? Yeah. Uh, Colin Palmer and Tony Fittock ask, how could you have strengthened your objection to the Hinkley Point planning application and the jetty delay and the increase in lorries due to the lack of trigger points for section 106 agreements within the DCO may have led to the application being refused by the planning inspector. Do you think this was an oversight by the council or a blind eye given to it by them? Okay, the, um, we could have paid some nuclear experts to have found flaws with the development consent order. That would highly likely to have cost a considerable amount. And you have to bear in mind that um, even now, the Office for Nuclear Regulation uh, reckons there are over 400 safety aspects of the Hinkley C uh, design and you know, taking things forward, the actual reactor operation that they have queries about that they're taking up with EDF. And that's all this time into the process of building Hinkley C. So if that, that being the case, you know, that it, it's, it's doubtful whether, given the fact that you're not just dealing with the planning with pins, you're dealing with the regulator, uh, the environment agency and um, the councils, and the government most particularly, that it's it's an uphill struggle to um, uh, make, our, make our objections any more relevant without a lot of weight from people who carry more clout than we do. Um, the things about the, the, the jetty delay and the lorries, the, as far as I'm aware, the, the councils had, it wasn't an aspect of the application that the councils had got a particular interest in. The EDF pretended that it hadn't got time to build a significant bypass um, from the M5 to the site. There wasn't time, but in fact, things were so delayed that it would have had time to do that if it so if it had so chosen. Chosen. So EDF um, makes up its own mind about which bits it's going to prioritise, and the the councils struggle to deal with that, particularly if it's something that is, if you like, uh, the, the jetty was going to get built sometime. The EDF plan showed a significant number of HGV journeys, irrespective of where in the process the jetty, um, in fact, it was always part of the plan that the jetty wouldn't happen first. Um, so you know, they just carry on as they normally do, or as, as they, they stuck to the plan they'd given out in that respect. And so nothing much as I can see happened or was ever really likely to. The, the problem the problem with the council thank you Roy. okay okay let's move on to local opposition yeah uh, josie bassinet john richmond and Anne mitchum ask three questions one about the attitude to hinkley point c from your district and county council and what advice would you give to increase the pressure on them that's the first one yeah who were your most effective allies and why who was listening and how did individuals help and thirdly, have people's views altered as the build has progressed? I don't know if you've got all those, Roy. Yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got it. I've got it. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a composite question. Um, right. The the councils are by and large in favour because they um, they see uh, boost to economic development in the district that they're responsible for. So that's what they're keen on um, seeing happen. I suspect that there is a very silent majority locally now who are opposed to Hinkley C. But the proponents of Hinkley C are as vocal as the opponents. And uh, you know, when, whenever a story, an anti-Hinkley story, or a story pointing out flaws in what's happening there comes out uh, and goes online, there will be there are a number of people, time after time, the same people who go on about how nuclear is the best thing since sliced bread and um, you know, generally keep that argument, the pro-nuclear argument going. Um, the one thing I would say is whether it's um, individuals or 
uh, landowners or the councils. You need to ask in advance for as much money as you possibly can to make sure that everything that they do uh, in, your, in your neck of the woods makes life as expensive as possible for EDF. For instance, the local school here, across whose front drive, the new bypass that was built had to go, was initially offered 30,000 pounds as compensation, and they ended up without um, a second thought, getting, I think, 130,000 pounds. EDF doesn't want to have to go through compulsory purchase orders, um, so there's money to be made. The other thing is that the overall package for um, Section 106 mitigation here was 20 million pounds. That is a pittance. People were pleased to see it because back in 2012, when austerity was really biting hard, any sum of money, particularly if it put into projects that were struggling to find any funding whatsoever, was extremely welcome. But in fact, I, I believe you should be asking for at least five times that amount and, and asking your councils to make the case for having a greater amount than that. Um, the, the, so council support is tempered by the fact that uh, they, they have put some clauses in, for instance, um, having more people staying in local accommodation than they've budgeted for triggers payments to the councils, which have got up to half a million pounds. Now that's a substantial amount and EDF has done everything it can to stop that happening again. It only happened the once. Um, so that's the thing to do about that. For individuals, okay, you should be looking for the best human interest story, best aspect, and get all your local uh, Facebook pages, the uh, local media and pins aware of what your concerns are. Uh, you should go and speak at any, pin, any pins local meetings that are held about the local things that concern you. And you should tell the media that that's the case because the media are a weapon that we didn't make good enough use of. Um, the local television channels need to be um, bombarded with stuff. And I've said it, I've got it written down. Six people and a placard, a couple of placards or a banner makes really good television. You don't need large numbers of people and the current situation, you know, we did a little event with just half a dozen people um, just before Christmas uh, out at Hinkley Point, and, and that attracted quite good publicity. So you know, don't, don't people, people have said, what can individuals do? You could do and should do whatever you think is pertinent to you. And let the, the larger groups and even bigger groups, people like Greenpeace, get involved in, and that's people I would involve, because at the end of the day, our quarter of a million signature petition against Hinkley C only got handed in at the moment that uh, Theresa May was saying yes to Hinkley C. So it was too late. So the sooner things like that happen, the better. Um, has effective allies? Well, people like in the, in the day, we had a green MEP. She was really good. Um, she said lots of really good things. She, she, was, she was on the media. She's been on Question Time and things like that. Um, so that's useful to get publicity. And as I said, your, your local famous faces are people that now the pressure is actually building. Uh, the, the Minsmere aspects, the fact that Pins is about to meet, the more those people come out again and uh, repeat what they've said previously, there's nothing wrong. The more times you say it, the more likely people are to pick up the message and the more it will register. The... Um, have As things have gone on, altered. sorry, have people's, have people's views altered as the program has progressed? Yeah, pe people got, okay, it goes in two directions. People who are um, have jumped on the, the gold rush economy uh, gravy train by giving up their existing job and getting a better paid, if not necessarily a uh, highly skilled job at Hinkley C. Um, have done quite well from it. But all those jobs are temporary. None of them last more than a couple of years, and I don't know what those people do, and neither do EDF. They can offer the odd individual case study of people who have progressed as the skill sets required have changed, but they've got no data about how that's happening. So you get new batches of 5,000 people at a time coming along as the skill set required changes. Local views here about what's happening 
um, things have gone quiet as COVID has put to some extent a restraint on the things that local people found most annoying, which was the volume of traffic uh, locally has reduced, despite the, uh, even though the Hinkley Sea traffic has not much reduced, there is so much less as there will be in your area because of COVID and fewer people traveling and commuting, uh, there's less of that. So there are the similar numbers of Hinkley Sea buses and HGVs on the road, but there's less other traffic. So there's less congestion if you're actually out there. But prior to that, the volume of traffic, the gridlocking in Bridgewater, the town through which everything pours to get here, uh, was a source of concern, as was fly parking in the villages. Because when workers are constrained to, the, to coming in daily um, and using the park and rides, or they're staying in the hostels and being bused to the site, there's less fly parking opportunity, which local people find extremely annoying. Thank you, Roy. I'm conscious of time, so I'll try yep. and move you on. Okay. This is from Linda Gemmill and Vanessa Raison. Yep. Two questions. How has the project impacted the day-to-day -day lives of residents living next to the project, as well as further away in Bridgewater, particularly on their health and well-being, and any adverse social impacts? And secondly, when EDF started building, how fast was the destruction, and were people surprised, or had they realised what was coming? Let's take the destruction first. I mean, that uh, was virtually instantaneous. As soon as they got the site preparation permission from what was then West Somerset Council, they were in. The woods went, uh, all, the, all the earthworks started, and uh, that's when the, the amount of earth moving became um, you know, enormously uh, significant. And once the cranes and the 24-hour working came in, the amount of light pollution, noise for the locals and the amount of traffic soon became um, you know, apparent to everyone in the vicinity. And local people, the, the people who live on the boundaries of the site, um, who must regret that they objected so vehemently to a wind farm where Hinkley C is now being built, must be really sorry they did that because they basically sold their houses to EDF for whatever valuation EDF put on them and they've gone and the incomers um, now realise that although the houses were cheap that came with the downside that they're now stuck there and they've got because they've bought as they've seen and caveat emptor they're stuck with houses that uh, you know, are not a great place to be living. Um, slightly further away the um, but most people weren't paying too much. The reason, uh, you know, people were shocked with what was happening because it, it's hard to get to grips with the depth of the development consent order. And, you know, people weren't aware of things like the length of time the nuclear waste has to be stored for, um, both here and potentially at Sizewell. So those aspects of it were you know, news to them. Um, the gold rush economy, which I will keep mentioning because it is a plus for people who get into Hinkley C, it is a downside for everybody else. Housing, rental costs have rocketed here because Hinkley C workers can afford to pay um, a lot more money for local rental properties than locals in local jobs can afford to and push up the market prices. And services. If plumbers, carpenters, electricians, those sort of people, um, and others with uh, more general purpose skills will go and take jobs at Hinkley C. That puts the cost of local services up to people who aren't in the Hinkley you know, gold rush situation. So you pay more for local services and they're harder to get. Thanks, Ryan. This is about promises, or should I say broken promises? <laughs> Um, it's a composite set of questions from yeah. Guy McGregor, Josie Bazinet, Anne Mitchum, and Nicola Pilkington. Yeah. What was promised by EDF and what was actually delivered? How many, if any, promises by EDF in terms of traffic, pollution, jobs, etc., have been broken since work began? Is the reality of the build in line with claims made during the planning process and at public meetings? Can or does anyone hold EDF to account? And finally, has anything been done to rectify problems caused by EDF as a result of complaints by local people? If people had realised what was entailed in building Hinkley C um, before it started, 
uh, you'd have been horrified before it ever got off the ground. Um, they, right at the start, they realized they got a heap of asbestos waste where they want to build Hinkley C, left from the Hinkley B, uh, sorry, the Hinkley A station, just dumped there and grassed over and you know, not hurting anybody. But as soon as you want to move it, you have to get a permission to move asbestos waste. And the guy from EDF stood up in front of Somerset County Council in January 2011 and said, this will all be done by the summer. In fact, they didn't start until the following February and they are still moving bits of asbestos waste out as they find odd pockets of it. The council, the Somerset County Council wrote to EDF in March 2012 to say, you've uh, exceeded the time we'd allowed you for this planning permission. We're not gonna do anything about it. We'd like you to stop, but we won't do anything about it if you don't. So that's how a planning permission like that works. Uh, when EDF are doing something like that, then even if they break or exceed the planning permission time restraints or anything like that, the council will tend to sort of shrug its shoulders and off they go. Um, they, so promises in, EDF promised us there will be a lot of traffic. They promised us there would be um, light and noise and uh, air pollution, uh, but they would monitor it. And, and that's what they've done. So by and large, particularly on the traffic, they have kept within the limits that they set themselves uh, and that were agreed. But, uh, and they do, they do deal with drivers who don't, um, who come out of hours, particularly if they do it more than once, um, who, who uh, they, they try, but they've got thousands of vehicles and uh, it's hard to keep tabs on and all. Um, the, 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 other, the other thing is that uh, they, their, their attitude to the locals is best summed up by their traffic management consultant, who when we were asking for, or people were asking for that bypass that went straight from the M5 to the site um, would have saved loads of people from all the inconvenience and everything else and saved Bridgewater from gridlock. Um, they weren't going to do that, but they got lots of fiddling little uh, road improvement things. He said memorably, uh, when there's no gain, when there's no pain, there's no gain. And that really sums it up there. They're here to build a nuclear power station and it's like a juggernaut. You know, if you don't get out of the way, then you're liable to get your toes broken, at least. So are they, are they held to account, Roy? Right, the accommodation thing is the best example of that. The, I'll give you the guy's name because you know, he's going to be you, your councillors and people if you want stuff about how Sedgemoor um, got the, the, made the best of a bad job. Because don't forget, you know, we had to fund the legal expertise that the councils uh, put in, whereas EDF have a battalion of lawyers, you know, highly, the, you know, the best people they can afford, supporting all the claims they make and making sure their legal side of it works to a T. Um, so the guy at Sedgemoor, Doug Bamsey, all right, was amongst the people who ensured that uh, this clause was put in about the where the number of people um, stayed who were Hinkley Sea workers, but not local, uh, what the limits were on that. And as I said, he managed, they managed to get half a million pounds out of EDF um, for exceeding that pit number of people staying locally who weren't locals. But uh, it's hard to do that. If they can be held to account, they, they will be. But once they've paid out a sum like that once, they don't want to do it again. Absolutely. So they take steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. And, and has anything been done to rectify problems that have been uh, reported by local people? Okay, well, mo most, people, most people's problems, if you like, are sort of more or less HGV related. When they were doing the site preparation work, all of the HGVs had a little roundel on the back with a number on it. So if you saw it speeding or stuff coming out of it or doing dangerous road maneuvers or going, going what you knew was a prohibited route, all you had to do was spot the roundel on the back with the number on it and let EDF know that number. Even though that supposedly that's still supposed to happen, once the number of uh, lorries shot up, then the count, even the council said, well, we're not doing it. they stopped doing that. Most of the HGVs have a working for HBC card in the cab, but you have to get, you personally have to log the exact 
day, time, place, and vehicle registration number to make a complaint about a vehicle. Fly parking is easier because it's there and it isn't going anywhere. So you can report fly parking to EDF and EDF employ people to go around and they have a little handheld device. They have a database of EDF registered vehicles and they look at the plates of people parked um, you know, who are clearly there for the day in villages uh, because everyone's got the right to park where they liked for wherever, as long as they pay their road tax. Uh, and if these people show up as being Hinkley C workers who shouldn't be parked in a village or a town, handy for the park and not, handy not for the park and ride, but for the, the walk and drive where you walk up to a bus stop and get on the Hinkley C bus there. If the people shouldn't be parked there, uh, they get warnings. And we do believe that a handful of persistent offenders have been given the heave ho, but it's only a handful and it remains a problem. And, and there are ways around it. Thank you, Roy. This is, I'm moving on quite quickly yep. now because we are running out of time, sadly. Uh -huh. uh, pollutants, this is from yeah. Julia Brown, Nicola Pilkington and Tony Fittock. Are you able to measure the impact of noise, light, air pollution in your community? What advice can you give us from Julia Brown? That was, how important is it to have baseline data on PM10s yeah. and 25s? Um, East Suffolk Council only measure, ha only have measurements for nitrogen oxide were noise levels capped at 65 decibels and were they exceeded? What was the impact on the community? Were air defenders made available? And how far was the other four measured receptors from the main construction site? OK, um, I haven't got the, the, the local data, but EDF do assiduously collect it. If you want to find data about stuff that's going on, EDF's own website with the subsection about Hinkley C and the subsection particularly about the transport and the main site fora are a good place to look for data like this because they regularly report to the transport forum and the main site forum about um, air pollution from transport and about noise and light pollution for the main site. The main site are people immediately adjacent to the Hinkley C um, project site. Uh, and transport is anybody with an interest. Um, I go to those. Um, so I'm local. I can see the cranes from my bedroom window. You know, it's not far away. And the light pollution as well. And EDF claim that they actually do, they respond to concerns about light pollution in particular and uh, do their best to limit the amount of light pollution that's taking place. But they still look up like a Christmas tree. Um, somebody, um, yeah, you may find yourself um, uh, scuppered by a lack of baseline data. Um, we didn't get the new bypass, the northern bypass, because the guy from county turned around and said, uh, there's never been a local demand for a northern bypass until EDF came along and said they wanted to build Hinkley C, then all of a sudden you wanted you want a bypass. Well, if you haven't got any claim made previously, then we can't actually support that. But so if, if you're, you have concerns and your council can do some measuring, I would urge you to ask them to do that now, because as you say, baseline data is invaluable. Uh, the ear defenders, yeah, that's absolutely true. The people who live closest to the site uh, have been issued with really high powered um, ear defenders. So they can go out in the garden and uh, you know, mime, I'd like a drink now to their partner while they're set out enjoying the sunshine, but are deafened. Uh, similarly, a whole lot of people locally adjacent to the new bypass that's been built and the main traffic routes have had triple glazing put in. But you know, people have to be quick off the mark because even if you were right up against it, if you didn't get your claiming quickly, it took a long while for it to happen, often after the bypass had been up and running for a while. But there, yeah, there are remediations that you can obtain. Thank you, Roy. What about the four measured receptors? How far are they from the construction site? Can you just briefly answer that? I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. Only I don't, I'm not an expert on all of these things. Certainly, I know there's one at a, a, a traffic lights next to a school at a place called Chilton Trinity, um, which is a concern because that's an obvious place where people, where the lorry drivers have to stop. Otherwise, EDF have them. They have them in the town centre. Um, okay, right. That's fine, mate. Don't worry yeah. about that because um, that, that's a very specific question. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, you, you don't have the information for. That's fine. We've got to bit of a flurry of questions on traffic. 
uh, Julia yeah. Brown and Westover and Alan Hacked, they ask, and I'll run through these quickly, is there any evidence to suggest that the worker code of conduct is effective in controlling routes to work, car parks and other matters which might affect us in Wickham Market, um, just up the road from where I am at the moment, such as fly parking, litter, shopping locally. The second question is, what, if any, measures do you wish were put in place in, at Hinkley to prevent rat runs, fly parking, fly tipping, and speeding? Suggestions, please, to reduce the above before it happens. Uh, third question, does EDF monitor workers and light goods vehicle journeys to ensure that the impact on locals is minimised? Can you give any details of monitoring and its effectiveness? Another one, what promises did EDF make to manage traffic to and from the site and through local villages and Bridgewater? And did EDF keep to those promises, e.g. staggered v HGV times, air pollution monitoring, etc.? Also, what is your overall assessment of how it's being managed to date? And finally, does light lighting ever go off in the four hour gap in the 24 hour shift patterns? Are the TIMAs at the Hinkley car park lit when not in use? Bit of a, a, a yeah. I'll work, bag I'll, there, Roy. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards in, in something because the lighting thing, as far as I know, there's no gap in the 24 hour um, thing here. They, they work 24 hours. Then, there's supposed to be a pause in HGV. Yeah, HGVs don't operate through the night. Um, but in, in terms of, in, in all other respects, there's, there's they work 24 hour shifts, at, you know, 24 hours round the clock at the point. Um, I don't know, I've, I've, I'm, I have no information about the lighting in the car park. I saw that question earlier in the parking okay. line. One, one of the first things that, um, EDF should be telling you all is that it will employ a certain number of extra police who will be directly related to developments at Sizewell C. They were one of the first things that actually happened long before anything really started and, and they were up and appointed and out liaising and doing you know, some community work and, and they will do speed measuring. So on the new bypass around the other side of my house uh, where there's a 40 mile an hour limit um, they're out there on a regular basis doing checks and presumably um, recommending you know, speeding fines. Um, that, and they're increasing the numbers. With the, the recent proposal to increase the number of workers at Hinkley C is accompanied by a commitment to uh, employ more policemen who will deal with you know, all sorts of social aspects around the, the, uh, the build. Um, they, the, the, the building of the bypass and the park and rides is supposed to reduce the amount of, of worker journey because there will not be uh, large amounts of car parking at the site. You know, that is one of, one of the things we were promised and it's true bar the 200 uh, fob holders who we've discovered there are a number of people they regard as critical who do have the right to park at the site. But they're, they're, as I've mentioned already, fly parking is an issue um and they, they do things about that the white van man we were also promised there'll be no white vans that's not true um th there are there's a white van park out there because a number of the specialist people they employ have specialist bits of kit which they need to get to the site so that that happens um so that was something that we were told wasn't going to happen that has happened um the, they're more concerned about making sure their buses and their HGVs uh, follow the routes than um, the, uh, the than individual workers getting to the park and ride. So that that, that just happens. You, um, not much, not much they do about it. If people if people speed, then you know they might get caught by local police or by the Hinkley C police. But. Uh, Thank you, Roy. And, 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 and the local businesses, some local businesses will be keen to see Hinkley workers because in villages, you know, the Hinkley C workers shop, stopping at the local shop, you know, are a, a, a keep the local shop running. So you have, you have to balance the fact that there are a number of people benefiting from the economic input that a huge project like this brings. But presumably the use of rat rums is quite prevalent. I'm not aware. I'm, 
you, you could argue that I use a rat run getting from here to Taunton because going to Bridgewater, uh, which is the, if you like, the A road way to get from here to Taunton, I've, I've, I've never done that. And I have had a county, a county council official describe the route I take as a rat run, even though from this village to Taunton, it's the shortest route and, uh, you know, it's the one I've always used. So, uh, yeah, but you, it's not, it's not obvious. It's not line ob of least resistance. Yeah, it's not obvious that there is a huge amount of rat running out here because the there's no parking at the site, and the place to get to are, are the park and rides, which are on the M5, one in Cannington, one out west of the site. Um, so the strategic they are strategically placed to uh, deter people from trying to find alternative ways of um, beating the, the the queues and the crushes to get the, amongst the workforce to get to the point. Thanks, Roy, that's great. We've got three uh, three categories, well, yep. maybe four left. Um, this one is on CO2 and it's from Adrian Dickerson. Yeah. Given the huge CO2 burden from construction and the relative cleanliness of the grid by the time sizable sea generation begins, does Roy believe this debt is ever likely to be repaid? And given that action on climate change is needed now, do governments, how do governments get away with classing nuclear energy as being green? That's I don't know if you've got a views on that, Roy. That's easy. There are a whole lot of, of uh, reports and research been done about how, um, how long it takes for payback to happen. And a ballpark figure is that a nu nuclear reactor only stops, um, reaches the point a break-even point where it's the, the amount of CO2 and other um, pollutants that have been involved in its construction um, is, is exceeded by or is, is balanced by the lack of pollution during its operation about 30 years into the life of the reactor. That's a ballpark figure as we understand it. I have no idea why the government regards Nuclear is green, none whatsoever. It's a mystery. Yeah, uh, yeah. 390 tons of spent nuclear fuel from sizable B doesn't sound very clean future to me. Okay, we're moving on to workers. Um, just a few minutes left. Did the workers, this is from Alan Hatt, did the workers on, on site, excuse me, in the on site hotel stay on site as EDF led us to believe? Well, okay, currently, obviously, they've got nowhere to go. And uh, I, I showed you this earlier. Uh, there's now the workers themselves are now complaining about the, the fact that due to COVID, if they have to live locally, the hostels where there is accommodation of 1,500 people are, and hotels are pretty much the only people they can do that. Having digs um, in the towns is, and villages is now a no-no. Um, but that will that we will revert to how that used to be the case. The, the hostels are, are you know they've got some, but, but uh, to some extent the uh, the local economy in terms of clubs, pubs, and restaurants does benefit from um, the, uh, the the fact that the workers in the hostels, particularly in Bridgewater, will go out into the town to get food and drink and entertainment. Um, on the main on the site there's only five there's 500 beds um and and the, they have got facilities and things there um but they will use village pubs and things like that and uh Thank you, Roy. it doesn't stop them no um just uh, two left economic impact tony fitter asked could more have been done to challenge economic impacts on communities, for example, displacement effects on business that was under under forecast, employment benefits that were over forecast, etc. Okay, I wrote this down earlier. Possibly, okay, but you have to remember that over promising and under delivering is actually de rigueur currently. You know, it starts at the top of the government and uh, goes elsewhere. So, you know, for EDF to EDF might have started the ball rolling, but it's been picked up and uh, carries on relentlessly. Um, mm. the, the, they did reduce what they, pro what they said. Initially, they talked about 50% of the workforce would be local. Don't forget, local means 90 minutes drive time from the site. So mm. with the um, uh, Seven Bridge now being toll free, that means we can get people from Cardiff 
coming to work at Hinkley C and we can get people from as far west as Plymouth coming to work at Hinkley C and they may be doing it daily and they will be classed as local. That's so incredible. no one here is going to consider them local and, you, and you'll be able to do that those figures for around your around the site at Sizewell as far, how far away EDF will class as local people. You know, we, we, we have really local people, the local villages between where I live, village four miles, the thing, people closer, they're saying, what about really local people? Mm, not too sure about that. Um, the, uh, so, so the, they, yeah, yeah. They, they have reduced from 50% to 30%. So they did over um, promise on the number amount of local workforce. Thanks, Roy. Uh, the last question here, well, not the very last one, but the uh, materials. Did the mining of the extensive sand, gravel and aggregates required for the build come from a local source or further away? And if so, where did it come from? How far? That's a question from Alan Hatt. Yeah, that's easy. Um, I can see the quarry. Limestone, most of what we're talking about is limestone aggregate. That's what they need to make vast amounts of concrete. And they need really good limestone. And allegedly, the limestone in the quarry that's just across the road from my house in Cannington um, wasn't good enough for nuclear concrete, uh, which is a, you know, their own idea of how it has to be. And uh, they, so they've gone to the Mendips, which is a vast source of um, limestone, um, enormous quarrying out there. And that's about 40 miles. It, it's, it's um, if you if ever see, if you, if you watch the Glastonbury Festival, uh, the festival itself takes place near a Shepton Mallet, which is where the, um, well, if you've been, it's, it's, it's much closer to that than it is to um, Glastonbury, to, to the quarries. And that's about a 40 mile each way journey. That before they built the jetty. And after that, once they got the jetty, those lorries have had to go into Bristol and to the docks at Avonmouth to be shipped from Avonmouth um, to the jetty at Hinkley, Hinkley Point. Um, I understand they're also using um, quarries in Wales. Now they've got the jetty up and running and they're coming across the channel. But the um, using ships and stuff like that, because of the tidal range on the Bristol Channel, it's a moot point how, you know, it's, that, that's a token to make it look as if they're doing something that is marginally more um, uh, environmentally friendly, marginally. Thanks, Roy. I've got a last question for you. Um, this is from Colin Palmer. Is your campaign to stop Hinkley still active? Fill your boots. Yeah, we, we certainly are. If um, if you look at look at the website and uh, you know the the um, you know we we do events. We we've been out on a regular on a regular basis. We attend uh, the community forum, the transport forum. Um, we we do our best to be a thorn in the side of EDF. You should beware from being friendly with anybody at EDF, anybody at the ONR, the environment agency, the moot point, and uh, the government, because basically all those people, particularly the ONR, are interested in seeing new nuclear build happen. Okay, so you know they're on, they're a regulator that doesn't regulate. Then they're, they're supposed to uh, be at the interest of the public. At heart, but really they got the interest of the nuclear industry at heart, and that's the yep. flaw. And go along with that, absolutely, Roy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for your time uh, answering those questions, Roy. That was a bit of a, a canter through the issues. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I hand back to Alison. Alison, you're you're caught. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Pete. Um, and thank you, Roy. That's a fascinating insight into what your experience at Hinkley Point. Um, and I'm sure we're all with you in spirit, because as you say, it doesn't go away. You're, you're still fighting the fight. Um, I'm going to stop recording now, but okay. then I shall start recording again as we move into the second session. So thank you.